I trust the Lord, you know, I trust the Lord, but I don't trust that. And and I I like to move around anyway when I talk, so it's better for me out here. I hope it'll work for y'all. Um you know, it is it is difficult a lot of times being in the legislature and being sort of a pariah uh, because I want them to do things they consider too controversial, just obey God, you know. And that's why I'm there, it's what I'm trying to do. But, you know, the speaker's thing is, we need to have a majority. We can't do your stuff and have the majority. And so pretty much if I, you know, put my name on a bill, it's just about dead on arrival anyway. Because, I'll just tell you something. How did y'all, y'all remember House Bill 2? Yeah. Okay. Um, when they repealed House Bill 2, I was one of 38 who very proudly refused to vote to repeal it. Okay. And then that uh, next election, 2018... We had 75 Republicans in the House, okay? It only takes 72 to override the governor's veto in the House. 2018, we lost 10 seats, went from 75 to 65. So we went back up there in December, and uh, we had something going on in caucus. And I stood up and I told them, I said, look, I hope you noticed that out of the ten seats that we lost, eight of those were people who voted to repeal House Bill 2. I said, I keep trying to tell you people that if you would stand up for conservative principles, you'd have people crawling out of the woodwork to support you who don't bother now because you know better than the Democrats. I told the Speaker just a few weeks ago, right before session started, you know, he has this this thing about, um, you know, Maybe we agree with you, but we can't do this because we'll lose seats. Well, you've already done that by not doing what you should have. Uh, And so I went up to him right before session started, and I said, people send us here to take a stand. And he's like, I'm from Mars, you know. Like he couldn't believe I would say something so outrageous. People send us here to take a stand. Well, that's the only reason I ever ran. My predecessor, well, I loved the guy. We were good friends and all that, but uh, he'd done some things I didn't like. But the thing that straw that broke the camel's back was when he ran legislation to give in state tuition to illegals. And I told my wife, somebody's got to run against him. She and our son talked me into doing it. And the rest is history. Uh, nobody gave me a chance. I had the guy who had been chairman of the county commission run against me in 2012 in the primary because I got the appointment instead of him. And I can understand I got it by one vote. You know, And so he spent all this money trying to take me out. And... Um, I mean, he had a lot of money. Ed's on Fox News every day for over a month, and all these mailings he did out, you know, put out against me. I had $8,300. I beat him by 2%. And uh, they haven't been able to take me out since. Because I went to Raleigh and I got to work standing up for the rights of our citizens and, you know, doing uh, constituent services, trying to help people. And you can't knock me out of there with a stick because the people understand that I'm standing up for what's right and that I don't care what leadership says about it. So now I'm trying to stand up for the ultimate citizen's right. At fertilization, you are a human being and our state should be defending your life and punishing anyone who seeks to destroy it or does destroy it. Plain and simple. I mean, how hard is that to figure out? They had a a pro-life group to work on pro-life legislation this year. And I joined the group. I was hoping I'd have an influence on them. Mark Brody, bless his heart, he couldn't be here today because he's a, a construction uh, contractor and had emergency with one of the houses he's building so he couldn't come. 
He's the only member of that group that would sign on to the bill with me. And only got three co-sponsors. That's George Cleveland, Jay Adams, and Keith Kidwell. That's all of us that signed on to that. And that's kind of disheartening. But as you've heard explained to you, so I won't go into all that, they're scared to death of this kind of thing. They tell me if you run a bill like you're trying to run, we'll lose the whole thing. Because it won't pass, you know. And everything that we have tried to do will be for nothing. It'll all go away. Give me a break, you know. And I've told some of them, if you would join me in this fight, maybe we could get it done. The only reason we don't get things done is because we don't try. I told my daddy one time when I was a kid, I, there was I, something he wanted me to do. I said, I can't do that. He said, don't say, I can't. Say, I haven't tried. You know, no such thing as can't. So I'm trying. And as has been alluded to, yeah, I'm in trouble. <laughs> They're in more trouble. They just can't see the guy they're in trouble with. You know. And I think my guy is going to beat the guy who has them intimidated. You know. That's coming. He already beat him. He just, the guy won't give up. You know. And that's one thing we have to learn as, as Christians, as, as people trying to save life and, and say it's sacred. We have to preserve it. We have to protect it. The other side will never stop. Why do we? Why do people on our side of the debate who won't go as far as we want to go, why will they just stop? I used to be uh, on the Pastoral Advisory Committee of Action League for Life in Charlotte back in the 80s and 90s. And... Uh, we thought about this a lot. We looked around. I don't know how many churches there are in Charlotte now. At that time, they estimated it was about 700, 750 churches. We would have maybe 50 to 100 people show up for a rescue and shut the place down. But we said if one member from every church in Charlotte would show up, we could shut them down for good. But they wouldn't do it. Had one pastor even tell our leader, Karen Graham, uh, you do a lot more good just come in the basement of my church with me and our group and just pray. Praying is very important. Did he think we weren't praying when we're out there on the street? He was trying to protect what he had. Well... How many of you are veterans? God bless you. Thank you so much. I'm not a veteran, but I have a lot of them in my family. My daddy was Navy World War II. You know, you mentioned a while ago about Rusty being born in, at uh, uh, Cherry Point. My dad was management uh, head of the management assistance office at Cherry Point. And uh, so it's very familiar to me. I've done some construction work down there myself. Uh, he was Navy World War II, worked at Cherry Point. My Uncle Charles, his brother, joined the Navy the same day my dad did so he could go keep an eye on him. He had already been in the Navy and out, I mean the Army rather, and he was 10 years older, but he went to keep an eye on my dad. Um, my stepfather was my dad's first cousin, and he was first sergeant of a tank destroyer unit under Patton in Germany. He married mom about 12 years after daddy died. And when I got involved and I went to jail, of course they were concerned. That was outlandish to them. They'd never heard of such a thing. And he and my mom were, were saying, how can you do, you know, you're, you're endangering your career as a pastor, you know. And, and how can you do this? What about your kids and all? And I looked at Bump, my stepfather, and I said, Bump, you fought your war. I'm fighting mine. It is war, my friends. And if you want to see spiritual warfare 
on a first-hand basis, go be a legislator in Raleigh. Because it is spiritual warfare big time over there. Amen. But why am I doing this? Okay, I'm in trouble. People tell me it can't be done. Why am I doing this? You and I know that Jesus Christ is the incarnation of the Logos, the Word of God, the very creative power behind everything we see around us and the giver of life. He is also not only our Savior. He didn't just come to save sinners. But on that day, He's also going to be our judge. Now I think if somebody created us, gave His life for us, and is going to be our ultimate eternal judge, if He says something, you better pay attention. If He tells you to do something, you better do it. If He tells you not to, you better not. Right? Now that's whom I'm about to quote. Is that person, and we better listen to him. Matthew 18, verses 10 through 14. He says, See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven their angels always behold the face of my Father who is in heaven. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go and search for the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Every one matters to him. Now, the abortion industry likes to hide behind the word fetus. They don't want to, you know, no, I think maybe they're starting to say it's a baby now, but they, they've never wanted really to say it's a baby. They want to call it a fetus. I wonder if they ever stopped and thought about the fact that the word fetus is a Latin word that means offspring or little one. I believe when Jesus said not to despise one little one, he was talking about the ones that hadn't been born too. Not just the ones that had been born. Now he's commanded us. He said their angels, their guardian angels in heaven are complaining to the Father. They see him all the time. You know, you and I as sinners, we cannot look on the face of God and live. Imagine these created beings that are there for the glory of God, they actually get to look on God's face according to what Jesus said. Such creatures serving His glory and serving His will are complaining to Him about any mistreatment that's happening to these precious little ones. And you think God's going to ignore that? You think He's not going to bring retribution? Oh, yes, he is. And you hear different figures thrown around about how many we've killed. Well, I'll tell you something. My figures are at least 72 million, maybe 80, maybe more. But I never go by the reported figures, and I'll tell you why. In the summer of 1972, excuse me, 1992, let me get that right. Summer of 1992, we went to Harold Hoke's clinic, the Hallmark Clinic in Charlotte. We had people take telephoto pictures of the staff throwing these bags in a dumpster. And we went back at night, five nights that summer. I only went one night. The night that I went, we found the remains of 32 babies. Um... All told, for the five nights, there were 128 that we found. Most of it was the consistency of hamburger. I'm sorry, you know, but that's how it was. But we did find some with identifiable body parts. Little crushed heads. Little stomachs. The arm with the scapula attached. Things like that. And there was one that we found that was from the knee down to the foot, about that long. And there was a neonatal intensive care nurse from Fayetteville who was there with us that night. 
she identified that as being around 20 weeks. And I'm going to tell you something. It does something to you. If you haven't seen that, you can imagine it, but it ain't the same as being right there and having that. And when you hold that in your hand, you know that I don't care what the reason was for it. There is no excuse. And I understand about... uh, not wanting to protect a mother from prosecution. I've had to kind of come around to that because I've come through the pro-life thing to get to where I am. Had a problem with that. I'm beginning to understand that. But one thing you need to know too is there are some who aren't given a choice. I've seen a 14-year-old girl being dragged into the building by her mother screaming, don't make me do this. Begging anybody to stop it. Of course, if we'd have tried, we'd have been arrested right then. And I remember thinking, the cops ought to be putting a stop to this. That girl is begging not to be taken in there. What kind of mother? I mean, it's, it's bad enough to kill your own. What kind of mother would force her child to go through that? I've seen some things nobody should have to see and had to deal with that, you know. And I just, I cannot, no matter what they tell me, no matter how they threaten me, and I do get death threats, I can't just let this go and do nothing about it. I saw... Bernard Nathanson's video, The Silent Scream. And you couldn't hear anything, but yet for months after I watched that, I'd wake up in the middle of the night because in my sleep I was hearing those children scream. I was warned. You know, you're going to get in trouble if you get involved with this. I was told, oh, you can't afford to get arrested. But they can never drown out those screams. <laughs> I'll tell you a little something about me. When I was a kid, you, well, you might not find it too hard to believe I was a pudgy little kid. And the bullies on the playground always wanted to pick on me. Because they thought I'd be easy. <laughs> I wasn't easy. And I, would, I wasn't a great fighter. And I wouldn't fight unless I really had to defend myself. But they'd be beating the immortal tar out of me. And I wouldn't quit. So I figured when the other guy quit, I won. You know? I'm still fighting bullies. Been doing it all my life. And the pro-abortion crowd are some of the worst bullies out there. They're going to do everything they can to make us back down. But I want you to join me in the pledge. We're not going to back down. I had to run this bill. But the difference in my bill is it's a constitutional amendment. Which means Roy Cooper cannot veto it. Our problem is getting past the legislature. Our problem is getting past people like Tim Moore, the speaker, who doesn't want to let it be heard. Uh, A couple years back, I I tried to run uh, a bill to add to our woman's right to know law uh, to say that you can't give them the RU486 pill without giving them information about being able to reverse that. My former doctor, Matt Harrison, uh, is the one who developed that reversal process and asked me to run that bill. They took it away from me. They gave it to Pat McElrath. They said, we can't have a man running an abortion bill. It has to be a woman. So they got Pat to do her own version of it, and they still didn't run it. So this year, I said, heck with that mess... I'm just going to go for the whole thing. I'm going to try to get it outlawed. 
That's what we need to do. Now I know, I know, babies will still die. Because it was illegal before and they were still doing it. Harold Hope that I mentioned, he was a back alley butcher before they made it legal and he was able to come out in the open. Uh, so some will still die. But at least it won't be legal. We have to make it illegal. And then we have to continue to work on people's hearts and minds until it becomes not only un illegal, but unthinkable. Right. Yeah. Right. That is our task. Now, Psalm 106 was mentioned before. It said that because they sacrificed their, daughter, their sons and their daughters to the demons, he allowed their enemies to rule over them. Now, think about that a minute. When Red China owns so much of our debt, and when we have a president who is willing to bow down to them and not offend them if he can help it, and who is pro-abortion, do you not think our enemies are already ruling over us now? 2 Kings chapter 24 verses 1 through 4 we are told that when the downfall of Judah finally came and the Babylonian uh, exile occurred it was because of the sins of Manasseh and the people following him in the shedding of innocent blood he sacrificed his own son to Moloch okay he led the people to sin in performing child sacrifices to these false gods. But maybe if you've read that passage, you know what I'm talking about. You may or may not have thought about it. That destruction because of the sin of Manasseh in which the people followed him occurred after Josiah's reforms. Josiah tore down the altars. Josiah called the people to repentance. Called them back to serving Yahweh. Called them to righteousness. And many of the people were affected for time. The destruction came anyway. And my fear is that even if we succeed with turning things around, it may be too late for this country. But I have to do everything I can to try to save it while there's an opportunity. Proverbs 31 verses 8 and 9 says, Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are left desolate. Speak up. Defend the rights of the needy. The poor and needy. Who's more poor and needy than an unborn child? I'm not satisfied at all any longer. We had a bill the other day to say you can't abort the uh, autistic children. I, you know, I, I just went outside. I didn't even vote on it. And the speaker texted me, are you coming in to vote? And I told him then, I'm tired of voting for these bills that tell us you can kill certain children and not others. And I'm... He said, I understand. I'm not sure he really does. I need you to come to Raleigh and make him understand. And there's going to be many others that you need to get to and make them understand. Now next Wednesday, you're having this rally and I'm thrilled to death because I've been feeling so alone and trying to fight this battle for so long. It's good to have help and I appreciate you so much. Uh, I don't know what the schedule is going to be like next week. We were told that we have some votes on Tuesday. They didn't say anything about Wednesday. You may not find many legislators there. I don't know if we're going to have votes on Wednesday or not. So there may be only a few that you get to talk to. But you can go to their offices, whether they're there or not, and you can leave information. And you can call them. You can email them. You know, there's all kinds of ways you can contact them. But one thing I do know is it'll probably get covered 
by the media. Now, they won't be fair in their coverage, but as big a crowd as we can have out there for that rally, it'll, it'll get noticed. Speaker may not be in his office. You may not get to talk to him, but he's going to know about what happens. Jerry Falwell said a long time ago that politicians, the average politician, doesn't see the light until they feel the heat. <laughs> Bring the heat, folks. Now, we do have to be peaceful, we have to be respectful and all that. But bring the heat. Bring the light of the glory of our Lord to shine on what's actually happening. I told my church the other day, anywhere that people don't want to hear about Jesus, anywhere they don't want to hear about Jesus, is our mission field. We need to go for it. I just appreciate you so much for coming out today. So much has already been said. I don't need to go over it again. But I so much agree with these fine gentlemen and the things that they've told you today. I have to do this. And I guess you're here because you have to be a part of it. The Lord has given us the command, and we will obey. Amen. They say I'm not a team player because I don't always go along with my caucus. I am a team player. I'm just part of a different team. My team owner and coach and all is the Lord Jesus Christ. And my team is the people who elected me. They've tried so hard to get rid of me, they couldn't do it because the people knew where I stood. And that's what mattered to them more than all the things they could say against me. So, I have to say, I am nothing. You know, I don't deserve to draw another breath. I am nothing more than a sinner saved by grace and until the Lord comes that's all I ever will be but I'm his that's why we're here today we belong to the Lord of life let's pray almighty God our father I just want you to bless each and every person here and bless their families Lord give them protection soon they'll be uh, heading back home back to their regular life and their families. Lord, get them there safely. And Father, bless them to be able to reach others, to stand up and demand of our government that they carry out the number one function of government, which is to protect and defend innocent human life. Father, use us for your glory. Make us stronger than we thought we could be. And help us, O oh God, to be faithful, for you are always faithful. We thank you and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.